Good morning. How is that for a dramatic entrance? I feel like that kind of hit it on the head. All right, go ahead and open up with me to Exodus. We'll start off in 24, so you can head there. And I feel like it's kind of fitting that this is an end credit scene as the sermon title, considering Joey just did weeks upon weeks of Easter eggs. I feel like it fits nicely. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one. But a little bit of foreground before we dive into the book of Exodus. So just like history narrative for a moment, if you will. We have Genesis, the book directly preceding Exodus, which is the beginning, right? God created everything. And then from there we see him begin to work and choose his people, which is to be Israel. And then shortly after that, they go off and they start doing things and God guides them and God watches them fail and then God guides them some more. And then by the end of Genesis, we see them arrive in Egypt. And then for about 400 years before the beginning of Exodus, they're enslaved in Egypt. And if you're familiar with slavery, it's not a good time. So by the time Exodus rolls up, God chooses Moses as his individual who will guide them out of Egypt and to the promised land. So that's how Exodus begins. Now, about eight months after that, we get to chapter 20 of Exodus, which is where God gives them the Ten Commandments, which is those rules that I'm sure you've heard throughout the years of, like, do not steal, do not lie, do not murder, good stuff like that that most Americans and or Christians don't, or do their best to follow, right? And then we get to chapter 24. The Israelites are at Mount Sinai, which is where God gave them the Ten Commandments, and God is using them in this area to be his representatives, right? That's what he's used Israel to do up until this point. And now we get to chapter 24. So before we read, I'm going to pray real quick, take a dramatic sip of my coffee, and then we'll dive in. God, I want to thank you for this morning. Thank you for, com- thank you for letting us come to a place where we can worship you. God, where we can know and be reminded of the fact that our Redeemer lives. God, I thank you for this witness of baptism. Thank you for letting us see the faith of somebody as young as Brian, for letting us understand that salvation is not just something that we can do lightly, that it's a decision to follow you with our lives. And God, I ask that you would be with all of us this morning as we continue to focus on you, continue to make you the center of our lives. Help us to hear you, help us to know you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Chapter 24 starts off like this. It says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet as if it were a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hands on the chief of men of the people of Israel, and they beheld God and ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day... He called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of Israel was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So we'll pause there just to make sure that we're all at that same point. So the first part of it talked about the law for a little bit and talked about the sacrifices. That's just demonstrating that at this point, the Israelites were faithful. 
Like they literally said two different times, what the Lord has said, we will do. We're taking this and we're doing it. Now this is contrast to basically the rest of their time in the wilderness because after they left Egypt and up until this point, right, it's been about eight months, we see them complain and moan and groan and complain and be unfaithful and complain a little bit more. The way that this like demonstrates itself in my head, because I, I play through things kind of like movies, is imagine that you're on a road trip somewhere and it's been an hour and a half since lunch and you still got like an hour and a half to go and there's absolutely nowhere to stop. The complaining that I see in the Israelites is the complaining that I remember in my younger siblings, just so desperate for food and desperate for the next restroom stop and just overwhelmed by the inability to stop somewhere. Hold on, the train left the station. But they've been faithful up until this point. Then we get to the second half, and Moses, alongside the leaders of Israel, they go to Mount Sinai, and they're worshiping in the presence of the Lord, and then God calls Moses and his assistant Joshua to come up and to be in his presence, where he's going to give them these tablets, where he's going to give them the commands and the law. And so they do that, and Moses says, all right, the rest of you stay here, we'll go up, and we'll talk with God, we'll hang out with God for a little bit, we'll get the law, and then we'll come back. Now we see at the end of this chapter, a little bit of like foresight. It says that they'll be up there for six days, God will reveal himself on the seventh day, and then after 40 days and 40 nights, then they will come down from the mountain. We know that, the Israelites didn't at the time, that's just like a foreknowledge thing that we get since Moses wrote this after the fact. So it's kind of helpful. But just an interesting note, Moses would have gone to Mount Sinai on the first day of the week, right? He would have a Sabbath day's rest, and he would go on the first day, because that's when God called him. But it's interesting, because they went to the mountain, and then they went up the mountain, and then they sat there for six days. And then God revealed himself on the seventh day, which would be their Sabbath day. He's doing that because he wants it to be important. He wants to make a point. Having Moses come up to the mountain wasn't just a, hey, how you doing, buddy? This is a Let's chat. God was very serious about this. And then the 40 days pass, and from tw chapters 25 through chapter 31, which we will not read for your benefit, God explains the law. He gives it detailed to Moses. He wants Moses and Joshua to understand what is happening. And then we pick up in chapter 32. Again, it's been about 47 days since we left off in, in chapter 24. Chapter 32 starts like this. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Make us God, so we shall see before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of God that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But, motion, motion, but Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out, to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning angle and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said to them, 
I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster they had spoken of bringing up his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and their writing was the very writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of shouting for victory, or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hand and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out, out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro the gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague upon the people, because they made a calf, the one that Aaron made. All right, that's all stretch. That was a lot of reading. All right, so brief recap of everything so far. Chapter 24, Israel is like, oh yeah, God, you're great. We're going to be faithful. We're going to do exactly what you say. It's going to be a great time. And then God takes Moses and Joshua up on top of Mount Sinai, where he gives them the word, and... 47 days later, God says, all right, you can go back to your people now because they're sinning and they're failing. And we get to chapter 32 and we get to see the extent of that failure and we see they've fallen away. Now, if you know any two things about the Old Testament, you know that one, people suck and some are better than others, but it's generally not by much. And secondly, we know that God is great. That God is really, really good at expressing his greatness because he is greatness. But I have a question, and we're going to spend the rest of this morning answering that question. The question is this. What changed? Why did the Israelites fall away from worshiping God? Why did the Israelites begin worshiping a golden calf? Why fall into idolatry? And the answer, not exactly a simple one, but we'll break it down together. It starts like this. Because they removed God from the center of his story. This whole book, beginning to end, is about God. The entire Bible is given to us that we would know God. And Israel, in this setting, removed God from that story. That's why they worshipped a calf. But why did they remove God from that story? Because they placed themselves at the center of it instead of him. They wanted to be the center of God's story. They wanted to be the power. They wanted to be the guiding force. They wanted to be the driver of the ship. Why? Because they were impatient. And I'm not just talking about in the span of the 47 days. I'm talking about in the span of their entire history. Israel didn't want to wait to receive power. They didn't want to wait to be recognized. They didn't want to wait to be forgiven. They wanted it now, and they were done waiting. 
This is just an expression of that fact. But why were they impatient? Because they didn't trust God. And that's something I think we all can relate to. There's times in our lives where we're faithful, where we understand, okay, God has a plan. Right now I'm in a rut, but I trust him to pull me out of it. But just as often, there's times when we're in a rut, and we say, hey, God, I know you have a plan. And we wait, you know, maybe, maybe a day, maybe two, and then we just jump. And we say, all right, this is what I'm doing. I hope this is what you wanted me to do. And sometimes it works out, and sometimes not so much, but we're impatient. And we see that in the Israelites, because they didn't want to wait for God. They asked Aaron, and he evidently was a little bit impatient as well, because he didn't even push them away from creating a golden calf. In fact, he said, you guys want a God to worship? All right, I'll give you a God. Bring me your gold, I'll make it right now. They wanted control. But why did they not trust God? Because they were brought from Egypt on account of the power of the Lord, not the power of the Israelites. If you go and you look at the history of, of, of Israel, they did not fight their way out of Egypt. God led them out. God provided an individual, Moses, who basically strong-armed Pharaoh into letting, them, letting the Israelites out. And then from there, God continued to provide for them. He never once allowed the Israelites to act for their own benefit, because they couldn't. They were weak. Now, God used that to demonstrate his strength, but the Israelites, they wanted to be the strong ones. They looked at their neighbors, they looked at the countries that they were passing through, and they said, look at them, they are powerful. Look at them, they are wise. Look at them, they have land. They have riches. They have materials. We have nothing. And they're sitting here at the base of Mount Sinai for 47 days waiting for God. Now, don't misunderstand. They didn't forget about God. In fact, if you remember in chapter 24, it says that the glory of God shone like a bright fire on top of the mountain. And I don't know if you've ever seen a mountain on fire. I personally haven't, but I can only imagine it's hard to ignore. They didn't forget about God. They chose to move on from God because they were impatient, because they didn't trust God. They didn't trust God because God didn't use their power. He used his own. Why? Because God's will superseded the will of the Israelites. The plan that God had for Israel was greater than the plan that they had for themselves, and God knew it. Additionally, God knows the plan for our lives is greater than the plan that we have for our lives. Imagine for a moment if God granted you everything that you thought was best for your life. I remember when I was probably like 10, first time I had a girlfriend. I said, I prayed and I said, God, I like this girl. I want to marry her. If God had granted that prayer and every prayer subsequent, whew, it would not have been a good life. But God had a will that was greater than mine. God allowed me to be molded and shaped over the years that I could become somebody who he could use. God's will is greater than our own. And it's the same thing for Israel. God knew that he was going to give them this law. Why? Because they had to have a way to atone. They had to have a way to pay for their sins. They had to have a way to pay for their actions that did not glorify God. Because that's, that's our norm. Our normal actions do not glorify God. The only way we glorify God is through salvation, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. And the only way we get that salvation is through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection three days later. We only get that through his gift of grace. Again, the Israelites were mad at God for not using them when they came out of Egypt. But God doesn't use us for great things. He used Christ for great things and allows us to be part of the picture. It's kind of like whenever you go to a rock concert, or maybe you don't go to rock concerts, but whenever you go to a concert, you take a picture with whichever member of the band, or, or if you're going to a sports game, whichever member of the sports team is your favorite. Right? I understand that most of you are Chiefs fans. If you go to a Chiefs fan, and you get in line to take a picture with Pat Mahomes afterwards, you're taking a picture with him. You didn't play a down of that game. You may have been a couch coach for the majority of your life, but you didn't do anything for that team besides, you know, 
buy a ticket and probably a handful of jerseys and foot the bill every now and again. But you didn't do anything. Your power was not involved there. And yet, Pat Mahomes allows you to be a part of that picture. God allows us to be a part of his, and don't misunderstand, Patrick Mahomes the second is not God. All right? I'll, I'll clarify that before I get questions later. But God allows us to be a part of the picture because of his grace, not because of our own merit. He says that though you are sinners, I will redeem you on account of my own greatness. So why did the Israelites worship a golden calf? Because they didn't trust God. Because they wanted to be the center. And how do we fix that? We let God be the center. We recognize that this whole story, I'm not talking about this book, I'm talking about our lives. The center of our lives is Christ. It's either a having of Christ and an acting on it, or a not having of Christ and dying on it. If we have Christ, then we have direction. That's not a direction to become successful, that's a direction to become obedient. And if we do not have Christ, then we have nothing. Because Christ is life. And I'm not talking about physical life, I'm talking about spiritual life. Because if we don't have a spiritual life, if we don't have salvation, if we don't have the Holy Spirit, then we're dead in our trespasses and sins, and that's just game over. So this end credit scene, this resolution of following Christ, it begins with repentance. It begins with an understanding that we are sinners, that we are fallen, that we have nothing in comparison to the ever-living God. It requires a reliance upon God, a remembrance that He is our sustenance, He is our guidance, that He is our everything. And lastly, it requires a relief, a reminder that it's not based on us. It's not based on us being perfect. It never has been and it never will be. It's about us being obedient. That is the end credit scene to the law because Jesus was the fulfillment. And He's our fulfillment as well. Let's pray together.